Welcome back to Elementary Statistics. In this video, we're going to take a look at two parameter data. Throughout this course, we have focused on situations where we have studied a population or a sample of a population. We have collected one measurement from each member of the sample, and we've tried to perform some analysis on it. We've gotten a little bit fuzzy with things a couple of times looking at taking the measurement from each member of the sample in multiple occurrences and comparing the results there. But we haven't really looked at comparing different kinds of measurements. That's the idea of two parameter statistics. Instead of looking at a single measurement for each member of your sample or population, we're going to look at two, or you could do three or four or more, but two is the nice place where things turn out differently. For example, you might look at people's heights and weights. You might look at a simple laboratory experiment where you drop something, you measure the height that you drop it from, and you time how long it takes for the object to fall. One of the things that I want to stress before we get into this is that all of the tools we already have for measuring a single parameter still apply. If you collect data on heights and weights of people, you can still go through and analyze just their heights. You can calculate the mean and the standard deviation, quartile scores. You can perform hypothesis testing on the mean but when you have that paired data, when you have the height paired with a weight, it opens up new possibilities. And so I want to focus on that side. Now that we have something new we can do, what other options have become available to us? So let me get my head out of the way and let's start in. The most fundamental tool for analyzing two parameter data is a scatter plot. And I'm going to go ahead and look at some height and weight data just to give us something to play around with. So I have here a sample from seven people where we have uh, measured their heights and weights in inches and pounds respectively. So 68 inches, 154 pounds, 72 inches, 173 pounds, and so on. When we set up a scatter plot, we need to choose one of these things to be the X value and one of these things to be the Y value. In this particular circumstance, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Uh, I am going to break one of the cardinal rules of graphing and put some space here so that zero isn't really zero. I'm going to go ahead and graph this with height in the x-axis and weight in the y-axis. And maybe I need to move this over a little bit so I didn't give myself enough space to put labels in. Luckily, I'm using a digital pen, so moving things over is relatively easy, as long as I grab all of the letters. Right. So my height range from uh, the lowest is 65, the highest is 73. And the weights go from about 145 to about 220. So I guess maybe measuring by tens. And then it's just a matter of plotting points. 
So 68 is here. We go up to 154, which is somewhere in the general vicinity of there. And we place a dot. 72 and 173 is generally around there and so on. So we have set up and plotted out our scatter plot. If we had more data, this might be a little bit more interesting. Uh, but I actually kind of like this data because there's no real pattern to it. Uh, height and weight data is what is known as very noisy data. There's not a lot of pattern or there is so much chaos going on that it's difficult to get to a pattern. But before I get there, I want to talk a little bit more about my decision to put height on the horizontal axis and weight on the vertical axis. In this particular scenario, I could have just as easily chosen to do that in the other order with height on the vertical axis and weight on the horizontal axis. But there are some situations where it actually does matter. The measurement that we put on the horizontal axis is called the independent variable. And the vertical axis is the dependent variable. It does matter which one is which, because in statistics, our goal is always going to be to use the measurement that we have for the one we call the independent variable as a tool for predicting the value of the one we call the dependent variable. Sometimes that prediction will work very nicely in either direction. In this data set, using height to predict weight and using weight to predict height are equally likely to be valid. In other situations, it's less apparent. In an algebra class, you might have talked about the idea of a function. And a graph is a function if each x value, each horizontal element, corresponds to exactly one vertical element. And it doesn't have to go the other way. So if you imagine, just really quickly, data that gives a shape that looks kind of like this. Using the horizontal axis, we can make a prediction about what's going to be on the vertical axis. But if we had started with that value on the vertical axis, there are two places that we may have ended up. Right. That doesn't always happen. And in fact, in the specific scenarios that we are looking at in this course, it is very unlikely that it will happen. But it certainly is something that can happen. And the real world is unfortunately a lot messier than the scenarios we talk about in math class. So we're going to look at some idealized situations, some carefully chosen scenarios where this is not something to worry about. But I want you to keep it in the back of your mind. Depending on the scenario, it may be the case that there are more than one value of the independent variable that gives you the same value of the dependent variable. In those situations, it is critically important that you set this up in the correct order. If you set it up in the other order, 
you're not going to get useful information out of your analysis. Even more generally, the idea of independent and dependent variables can come into play just in the nature of your um, experiment, the nature of how you're collecting data. Oftentimes, it is much easier to collect one type of data than another. In height and weight data, it's difficult to get somebody who is willing to have you collect physical measurements on them that will say one is okay, but the other is not. But in other situations, in unrelated situations, very often you have to be reactive about one of the choices. If you're timing how long it takes for a ball to fall to the ground after you drop it, you can choose how high to hold the ball. You can put it near the ground, you can lift it way into the air, you can put it somewhere in between. You are free to choose that. Once you let it go, you start the stopwatch, you stop the stopwatch when it hits the ground. Trying to set this up by starting the stopwatch when you drop the ball and getting the ball to stop at a certain time is not going to work. And so in that situation, it's very clear that the independent variable has to be the one that you choose and the dependent variable has to be the one you react to because the only time a prediction can be worthwhile at all is if you are telling the situation, I'm going to drop the ball from here, how long is it going to take? Trying to say that things are going in the other direction is nonsensical to your experiment. Now we have some data, we have created a scatter plot, and we want to start looking at this question. Can we use the data that we have to take the value of the independent variable and use it to predict the value of the dependent variable? The idea behind this is known as correlation. And you can have linear correlation or you can have nonlinear correlation. I think that these are some of the more obviously named things. When you are dealing with linear correlation, you are dealing with data that falls more or less in a straight line. When you are dealing with nonlinear correlation, you are dealing with data that does not fall into a straight line, either because it rises and falls, or maybe just because it rises. All, right. All three of those are examples of nonlinear correlation. As I said uh, just a few moments ago, we are going to be interested in this course in linear correlations. We are going to go in expecting that our data has a linear relationship. And if the relationship is nonlinear, then the results that we come up with in this course, using the tools we talk about, are not going to be very valuable. That's not to say that they're going to be of no value or that there aren't other tools you could use for nonlinear correlations, but we're going to stick with linear correlations because it makes the math doable.
a linear correlation itself can be further categorized as being positive or negative. You may remember from a previous course in algebra talking about the slope of the graph of a line. If the graph tends upward as you read it from left to right, we call that a positive slope or a positive linear correlation when you're talking about data points. If the graph tends a little bit more downward as you read it from left to right, we call that a negative correlation. And of course the line that models it is a line with a negative slope. We can also talk about a correlation as being a strong correlation, a weak correlation, or even being no correlation whatsoever. And I'm going to draw these using a positive linear correlation. You could draw these just as easily using a negative linear correlation or even a nonlinear correlation if you wanted to. but it does kind of fall into a spectrum. A strong positive correlation has data that is very much in a straight line. There's not really a lot going on otherwise. A weak correlation, that is very much no longer the case. In a weak correlation, there is a trend in a line-like direction. Often, but not always, you can kind of put a border on your correlation uh, to see that it is trending upward in a very wide line. Drawing a line through the middle is also sometimes reasonable. But as those points get more and more spread out, you eventually get to the point where you can't even hardly tell if there's a correlation at all. In this last scatter plot, is that a trend going upward or is that actually a trend going downward? Is it linear or is it nonlinear? I don't really know. And so we describe a plot that looks like that as having no correlation. This is the worst case scenario for trying to do a prediction. This is noise and not useful predictive data. And so I think that alone gives rise to the interesting questions. Looking at a set of data, looking at the graph of a scatter plot, are we looking at data that has a linear correlation or a nonlinear correlation, or no correlation at all? Is the linear correlation positive or negative? Is it a strong correlation? Is it a weak correlation? How confident are we in using that correlation to build a statistical model to make predictions? Just by looking at the graphs, we can have some idea of that but it would be nice to have a numerical model to fall back on. For right now, just looking at the pictures and being able to classify things generally based on the picture is good enough. It can get a little bit fuzzy, right? Where do you draw the line between a weak positive linear correlation and a strong positive linear correlation? Where do you draw the line between a weak correlation and no correlation? There is a very much a spectrum between those. And if you go beyond having no correlation at all, you can start to trend towards having a negative linear correlation. Sometimes you'll see positive and negative as a single spectrum. In the next video, I'll show you some calculations we can perform to give a numeric value to how strong the correlation is. And we will use that 
in order to make our statistical analysis of how good the predictive power is. We'll use our confidence levels, our confidence intervals, the same kind of language, and talk about whether we can say that the statistics backs up using this as a predictive model, or if the statistics tells us that there is no confidence in the ability of this to make a prediction. For now, I'll wrap up. As always, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.